Um, and then the last part uh, of the talk is really talking about how spinal cord injury really affects every single body system um, from the heart to the lungs, to the urinary tract, to the GI tract. And we're just gonna go over the various systems and the impacts of spinal cord injury on those systems. We talked a little bit already regarding cardiovascular, uh, that patients can have neurogenic shock, they can have bradycardia, they may need atropine or a pacemaker to increase their heart rate. Very commonly, they come in hypotensive, and we often have to give them fluids or pressors. And you know, we have level two evidence to suggest that keeping the blood pressure map at 80 or greater, greater can result in beneficial effects. So we often uh, give them pressors uh, for the first five to seven days post-injury uh, to improve outcomes. Uh, we do DVT prophylaxis. In fact, it is a requirement in patients with spinal cord injury because they're at such high risk of DVTs or PEs. And that's usually in the term in, in our center, Lovenox, uh, with anti-embolic stockings, some pe uh, or and compression boots uh, and early mobilizations. We tend not to do IVC filters and we tend not to do heparin. That the respiratory system can be severely affected because you can imagine if you're paralyzed and you can't use your intercostal muscles to help you breathe. And certainly if you have a very high cervical spinal cord injury that involves C234, or I'm sorry, C345, that you would inf infect your phrenic nerve function. So th they often have pneumonia, atelectasis, ventilatory failure, trach, uh, that's not uncommon. And uh, respiratory therapy um, is an important part and suctioning uh, for mucus plugs is an important part to prevent them from getting on a ventilator or ultimately requiring a trach. If they're a high injury like C1, C2, and their phrenic nerve is not working, they'll often need a, a pacemaker. Uh, and uh, this is showing a patient on a rotorest bed, which we uh, used to use more often than we do now, but it's a mechanism to improve pulmonary function and uh, reduce pressure sores. The genitourinary system's not working. They have no uh, spontaneous, or they have no voluntary contraction of their bladder. So they often require a Foley catheter initially. That's often changed to intermittent catheterizations when they're stable, they're suspect to urinary tract infections, and they can later on get autonomic dysreflexia, which is manifest by hypertension, sweating, headache, uh, particularly when they get catheterized. They can have uh, GI bleeds, uh, something re often referred to as a Cushing ulcer from the stress of the spinal cord injury. They often get H2 blockers uh, and they can have problems with alimentation. Occasionally they'll need an NG tube or even peripheral or central out hyperalimentation, but they do need to start the bowel program, which is often consists of lax laxatives and stool softeners. Uh, again, because their GI system's not working, they're prone to uh, contractures, pressure sores, heterotopic ossification, which is a bony formation in their muscles that can be a source of fever early on. Uh, again, uh, preventing pressure sores is critical, and both the teacher, uh, both the patient and the a caretaker are important in that. And of course, this is psychologically devastating to the patient and the family. So we have uh, psychology and psychiatry uh, involved early for counseling. Often the patients will require antidepressants. The hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.